Thank you, Chair, and welcome here, Mr. McDonald. We've been waiting in, in anticipation for uh, the opportunity to ask you some questions in regards to the audit. I just want to go back and clarify something I think I heard you say during your opening remarks, which was that the Deputy Minister has made the Grants and Contributions Program a priority. Um, did I also hear you say that this has been the case for a number of years? Yes. Okay. I think that's a little concerning when you consider um, what was reported by the media in regards to um, your audit and uh, the fact that what you found was uh, a poor oversight of millions of dollars spent on green subsidies and that the management of taxpayer funds was so sloppy it represented potential legal and reputational damage. And that was in your report, I believe. So if that's the case, and if it is the case that the Treasury Board has had concerns about the grants and contributions um, at Environment Canada since 2019, um, why did it take so long for this audit to be undertaken? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, Mr. Chair, the uh, department took this very seriously and they put together the DG committee uh, to review grants and contributions administration between 2020 and 2021. And during that time, they identified 17 recommendations that they would implement to, to address some of the key concern areas. So when we were doing our risk-based audit planning process, we identified this as a risk, but we wanted to give time for them to address the 17 areas which were, were quite important for the department to do. So we put this in our 2022-27 risk-based audit plan to make sure that we would have this project there to make sure that they were making good progress on implementing those recommendations. Okay. Uh, so I also believe I heard you say that you reviewed 100 agreements um, as part of this audit. And can you state again what the total value of the grants and contributions you, rever you reviewed was? So we reviewed the 100 agreements, and they were $79.5 million worth of uh, spending in 2022-2023 fiscal year. Thank you. What was the failure rate of those grants and contributions? So what we found in the audit was that actually the Section 33 and 34 uh, approval of the financial expenditures was, was good in all cases, except for two, there was some missing invoices. The, the main issue that we had was that we looked horizontally across the department at the administration, and it was re mainly related to the systems. There's seven systems in place where information is stored and also the information management practices that support the documentation uh, that the program managers use to manage recipients. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask the next, next question, thinking you might have just provided an answer, but what threshold must be met for these agreements to pass or fail an audit? I think the, the most important things that you would look for in the audit is whether or not the, there, there was breaches of financial issues like with respect to Section 33 and 34 in the payment process. And in, in the case of this audit, we didn't find any issues with respect to the payments. So that, that to me would be the most serious issue. So no issue with the payments. But we also heard about a lack of oversight and an inability to show value for money or at least show that what was paid for was actually received. Would any of this mean um, a failure on the part of any of these agreements? So the internal audit looked at the governance risk and controls in place to manage the agreements from a, a horizontal departmental perspective. We didn't look at one particular program. We just we, we chose files from eight different programs to make sure that we could satisfy ourselves that they were doing the right things. It just ended up being that there was some systemic issues with respect to the information systems and information management that could be improved. Thank you. We've Thanks. heard many times over the last couple of years that information management, lack of documentation, and the mismanagement of certain files across the board is an issue, and this appears to be falling into that same category. I, I mentioned that the Treasury Board raised concerns about the grants and contributions at Environment Canada in 2019. Um, you, I believe you said you made 17 recommendations. You wanted to give the department an opportunity to address those recommendations. What changes have been made since that time? 
So in a, a report two of the two reports that we produced, we, we did a follow-up on the 17 recommendations that were actually make, made by senior management at the DG level that were approved and endorsed by the deputy minister to address GNC issues. Um, we did find that about half of them were in progress and, and making good like making good progress and some of the key things that they have done is actually to get a community practice together which hadn't existed before so you have about 80 80 people every month meeting to talk about issues that they're experiencing within grants contributions they've strengthened the recipient audit framework which had been a finding also in our 2019 audit that this needed to be put in place so that the department could satisfy itself that the recipients are actually spending money in accordance with the terms and conditions and in, in terms of in accordance with their contribution agreements so the strengthening of the recipient audit framework and this community practice and putting in place an investment oversight committee where every grant over hundred thousand dollars that is deemed medium or high risk is also reviewed by a horizontal committee of directors general before these uh, programs are approved Okay, so how do, you, how do you square the circle that they're making good progress with what you identified as the management of taxpayer funds being so sloppy that it represented, and I'll quote, potential legal and reputational damage? Yeah, so when, when we referred to, that's on page 18 of the audit report, and that where we t talk about Sorry, potential... Sorry, I'm going to just make sure it's a brief response, please. Yeah. So that reference to potential legal and reputational damage was a potential impact if the issues with respect to information management and the information systems were not addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McDonald, for being here today. Could you please provide the committee with a list of the grants and contributions reviewed for this audit, the companies they were awarded to, the amount of money awarded, and the purpose of the grant or contribution, please? Provide that information to the committee. I appreciate that. Mr. McDonald, when this committee heard from Treasury Board officials on this issue, they continuously stated that it's up to the deputy heads to ensure that their department is up to standard and that the mandate of their program is met. Do you think that the deputy minister of ECCC has properly ensured that his department is running efficiently? I believe, as I mentioned in my opening re remarks, that the deputy has made grants and contributions one of his top priorities. and. The implementation of the 17 recommendations of that DG committee is a top priority, as well as the five recommendations that we made in our audit report. In fact, I think I, I was reflecting on this. This is one of the, the one times in my 20-something year career as an internal auditor where the actual deputy minister has made a decision to put in place a team that is solely focused on implementing recommendations coming from an internal audit. I think the commitment is there to, to really look at this system and make it better and make sure that the controls in place are solid and that we do have an information system that will support decision making. So I'm hearing in your response then that you feel as though the deputy minister has taken upon himself the responsibility to see the good overview of this program. Then in that case, uh, is the program impossible to run properly in your opinion because of the inc insistence of Minister Gibault that his department issue hundreds of millions more grants than its capacity allows? Do you, do you think he was just pushing through these millions of dollars to be distributed to his initiative, that it was his force, his will, that created this level of error and incompetence? Well, as you know, the, the public servants do through their Treasury Board submissions to get the program approval, and in your program approval documentation, you do identify the list of resources that you require in terms of the people and, and the operating money that you get. So the decisions as they're made by Treasury Board give the department the resources. And I can say, uh, like, we did an audit of classification in our department a few years ago, and it takes time to, once a program is approved, the money just doesn't come instantly and the program can't get up 100% on day one. So there's a period in time where you have to classify positions, hire the people, and as this committee has seen in the past, time to staff is an issue in the government. It, it takes the time to hire people. So the, the resources are provided through the submissions, through the budget process, and it's up to the department to implement. So it's sounding then like it even goes beyond Minister Gibault, that it goes all the way up to the Prime Minister. Do you think that the Prime Minister and with him, the Minister of the Environment, Minister Gibault, should consider the actual capacity of a department's resources before they dump hundreds of millions of dollars for them to just roll out? 
as, as I mentioned earlier, the, the departmental officials are really the ones that identify the resources required to implement the programs. Mm -hmm. Is the deputy minister able and comfortable, do you believe, to bring his concerns from this audit to the minister and the prime minister? Uh, my role in the department is really as an independent person in my department to talk to the deputy, and it's up to the deputy to express his concerns to the minister and the prime minister. As the auditor, do you believe that this program is sustainable with its lack of clear standards, the mismanagement of documentation, the granting of millions without a proper justification, or does it need space and time to fix these issues and allow the department to fulfill its mandate? Well, I believe that the processes are in place, and we didn't just look at one program here. This is actually the, the management control framework that is in place to support delivery of all of our programs. And I believe that the actions that are being taken are going to support the delivery of the programs. I've looked through many of the grants and contributions that ECCC uh, has distributed, and there are many examples of multi-billion dollar corporations receiving millions from this program. We have Glencore receiving $10 million, over $18 million to Rio Tinto specifically, which has a market cap of $103.549 billion U.S. as of last year. And of course, uh, Cornell University, a university that isn't even uh, within Canada uh, receiving funding. Are there any clear standards in place to ensure that businesses that are clearly able to fund their own interests are not receiving grants and contributions from Canada, especially at a time when Canadians are suffering as a result of the overspending of this government? Well, our internal audit looked at the processes that supported the delivery of these programs, and we didn't find any instances where terms and conditions were, were not met in, in the funding decisions. And funding is provided to eight different types of recipients, including not-for-profits, all the way up to those type of corporations. Hmm. And it, it is done for specific purposes in accordance with the policies that have been developed. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, it's been kind of really interesting seeing the various areas of spending within this audit. Uh, one thing that I had asked other officials about, and I, I, I don't, uh, I wonder if you have some context on this. Um, there are multiple entries of American universities that are funded through this. I tried to get some clarity and couldn't around why we are funding foreign institutions. Uh, I wonder if you have a comment on that, and then just in general, uh, how grants and contributions um, are supposed to be, or whether they're required to be or not spent on things that are actually in Canada, or whether we see uh, a lot of different areas of spending items that are uh, are not obviously related to Canada. So with respect to the first question, I believe the documentation will be provided to the committee in the coming days. It's just in the approval process right now. Uh, in terms of funding institutions outside of Canada, it depends on the terms and conditions of the program that that these funds are coming from. We do have some international obligations with international climate financing, and we also do have some in, in obligations with respect to contribution funding to organizations such as the World Meteorological Organization. So there are some terms and conditions and programs that you can fund outside of Canada. Okay. Um, it, do... Um, is there an expectation that other states would fund those activities if they're happening outside of Canada? Um, or is it is it sort of is this is this is that considered normal? I guess I was surprised to see this these funding for for these other institutions, and uh, of course we're affected by things that happen elsewhere. But um, but other countries are affected by things that happen here, and generally you'd expect this kind of research monitoring to happen um, with a focus on your own country, surely. Yeah, as I, as I mentioned, it's it's it would be part of the terms and conditions of the program whether or not the where the funding is going okay i guess yeah. that's i guess it's more of a policy question yeah exactly day, right? yeah so you're you're giving me the you're giving me the auditor answer which is uh which is your you know de depends on depends on whether whether it's supposed to or not fair enough so um we have and we will continue to ask these uh these these policy questions um i wonder if you can compare your analysis of the uh things happening at the environment department to other other departments as well and um we we had an audit here recently of uh just some 
very concerning things that have happened at, at uh, Global Affairs. And by the way, we tried to get uh, the minister to come in on that, and, and uh, Minister Jolie has, has not made herself available to this committee on various matters we've asked her to, her to come for. But there's been issues at, at Global Affairs, there's been issues at, at Environment. Um, how, how would you compare what you're finding in this department to some of those other audits and what exists at other departments? So when, when we undertook this audit, we, we the first step that a team would normally do is to look what other type of grants and contributions audits have been done across the government. And we did notice that there was a few in, in certain departments, such as global affairs. So what we, we learned from those. We learned where the risks were there so that we can strengthen our internal audit programs and strengthen the work that we're going to do in our department. But I would not be able to comment on the actual findings of audits of other departments. But what I can say is we do take that information into account when we're doing our work. Are you, are you making comparisons between things that are happening at certain departments? Uh, like, you know, this, this department, we're doing better than that, or we're doing worse than that? Or? Um, we, we have a network of chief audit executives where we get together on a regular basis with the Office of the Controller General, where we share practices, where we share findings. But as they say, we, we are learning from the work that others are doing, and we're making sure that we include those type of risks into our assessments when we develop our audit programs. Are there departments that aren't doing audits like this at all? Are, are all departments doing this kind of work, or were there, are there places where it's just not being looked at? Well, I believe each department has their chief audit executive, and they would be doing their individual risk-based audit plans. So it would be up to the risks that they identify in their departments okay. that they would look at. All right, thank you. Uh, can, I, um, can I ask as well just about some of these internal processes around this? Uh, oh, okay. Um, so let me, I'll just jump to this then. Uh, of, of contributions that are paid out, how many are repayable and how are we doing at actually getting back uh, contributions that are supposed to be repayable? I, d I don't have an answer for that. We did not include that in, in the scope of our internal audit work. What we looked at was the governance, risk, and controls that supported program delivery, but we didn't get to that level of detail in this report. Okay. It, it, did you not get to it because you, you didn't have the resources, because you didn't think it was important? Uh, or what was what was the reason why you wouldn't have included that in your work? It was just not in a step that was in our in our process. We we had enough resources to do the work. We took enough time to do this work properly, but that's not an issue that came up in the in the internal audit. Okay, maybe it's something to think about for the we, yeah, thank you. Is that time Terry? That's your time. We're gonna go Thank you, Chair. I think as I referenced earlier, this committee has seen the consequences of the utter failure of governance, risk management, and internal controls in the case of Sustainable Development Tech Canada, ArriveCan, and others. You've mentioned that you, uh, that you have a, a good team uh, as the chief audit. Uh, there's a big team of finance and audit professionals, a CFO, and you have chief audit executives. How come then are there such inconsistent approaches to financial management? What's the breadth and scope of inconsistency, and how loose are the internal controls? Speaking for our department, I think the CFO is responsible for signing the attestation on controls. The CFO is responsible for the system of, of internal controls over financial management and reporting, and, and it's her obligation to review those. And our role is to come in and look at, are they doing it appropriately? And I think that every department goes through this. You go through your risk assessment. You see what are the priorities of that department, what are the key risks that you're facing, and then you develop a plan to provide assurance to the deputy on the areas that need focus, such as this grants and contributions administration across. But in general, I believe the controls are pretty, pretty well established, and it's oftentimes a case of the implementation control of the controls at the program working level. So the... The controls are established, but they're not implementing them. The recommendation to strengthen controls and practices and conflict of interest, cash flow, and the claim review processes actually are very concerning. If the audit has to make such recommendations, there has to be serious lapses, leakages, and weaknesses in, in, in internal controls. Did you advise your deputy minister... Minister and Comptroller General of these issues? Yes, we, we advised, first of all, the CFO through the audit process when you're going through the validation of the facts. Then we also advised the deputy when we went to the audit committee meeting. But in terms of this 
case, it was more a case of inconsistent application of the controls versus actually non no controls. So it's okay. inconsistency across so, the department. So there are controls in place, but they aren't being applied. But the majority of the controls were being applied. Okay, I'm, I'm a little confused by what was in your audit and what you've answered today and saying, you know, they're there, but they're not being applied, and then you're saying the majority of them are applied. That sounds a little inconsistent to me. Um, did you advise these individuals of the risks of not applying the, the controls consistently? Yes. Okay, thank you. And my last question, if there are no Section 32, 33, and 34 issues, why is the audit making recommendations to strengthen financial practices around cash flow processes? Well, we, we did note some, again, inconsistencies in how this was done across the, the, the department. So, for example, when you're looking at, at program officers who are probably just trying to help the recipients by pre-populating some forms, it's not really a good practice for departmental people to pre-populate forms for the recipients to submit their, to submit their, their, their final funding. So I think it's better to, to have that arm's length approach where the recipients are filling out their work and the department of program managers do their job in terms of validating and monitoring. Right. So it's not really a good practice or it's not a good practice. It's not a good practice. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks.